Now, coming to the stage from the WWE, please welcome Paul Heyman. You can cut the music now. L ladies and gentlemen, um, my name is, is Paul Heyman. Um, if, if I were to be asked to describe the credit for the enormous business boom in WWE, if you read this morning on John Wall Street, WWE's net profits have doubled, doubled, since 2019, if you ask me why, I'll give you three answers. One, the business leadership of our president, Nick Khan. Two, the creative leadership of our chief content officer, Paul Levesque. And number three, the fact that we are blessed to have the single biggest box office attraction in sports entertainment history. And that can be documented by the fact that our top star has been, since 2019, this man, the tribal chief, Roman Reigns. Backstage, we're saying, how come I didn't get an introduction like that? <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for staying around. Um, we're talking WWE, which in 2024 means we're going to talk about Netflix as well. So I wanted to throw out a poll question. We're going to post it on the big screen here, but take out your phones so you can scan the QR code. And it's a fill in the blank question. Live sports and sports entertainment on Netflix is blank. Great, I'll be watching. Meh, I'll stick to the true crime docs or I don't have a Netflix account. Not sure if there is anyone who doesn't have a Netflix These account. These days, I feel like it's Exactly. But please scan the QR code. Please respond, and we'll be showing the results in real time. But of course, WWE and Netflix, it's the, the new modern uh, marriage, right? Absolutely. And like, so you're primarily on WWE SmackDown, like on Fridays, right? right. Uh, Raw is moving to Netflix in January. C can you take us through, like, how big a deal is this for WWE? I think this is the biggest deal of all time, to be honest. Um, but the, the thing that changes the whole landscape for us is that we've been on linear television for decades now, and we've been the leader of that um, episodically. Um, so to take our program and to put it on a streaming network like Netflix, um, it's just unheard of. We, I mean, to, to go all the way back to, through our history to see where we are now and the growth that we've had um, really since 2020, you know, when the world was upside down, has just really been amazing. So it's a, it's a big opportunity for us to not only showcase our product, but just what we've mastered with live television. And WWE has been a little more like edgier lately, a little more blood, a little more swearing than, than in previous years, I would say, right? Uh, Netflix seems to be uh, particularly well equipped to allow that sort of thing. Um, so like, do you expect to lean more into that direction after the move? If we allow Paul to do Hall of Fame speeches uh, nonstop, we'll definitely push that envelope. But uh, for me, I don't know. I, you know, I've always enjoyed the challenges of being PG. Uh, it, you know, and no offense to our predecessors and the, and the people who came before us and the ratings that they revolved around, but to me, it's a, it's more challenging to be able to tell these stories, and then it also allows you a broader audience to connect to, um, which I just really feel like is always the goal. We want to reach as many people as possible. And I think there's a fine limit to when you can, you can kind of cross that threshold to where you push people off from the product. So I think there's a nice, you know, there's going to be a nice little range there that we can play with. And, 
you know, push the envelope in certain senses, but I think we need to stick to our values and, and kind of the morals that we, we've set in place and the culture that we have now. It, it's all storyline dependent also. Yeah. You know, what does the story call for? Uh, there, there are stories, there are stories in, 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 on our show that call for a kiss at the end. There are stories on, on our show that calls for a punch at the end. There are stories on our show that, that calls for a level of aggression that transcends into violence. Mm. So it, it, it really is, is storyline dependent. What is the intensity? What is the purpose? What is the theme of the story that we're trying to tell? I realize that we didn't introduce ourselves. Kim Basine covers celebrities and athletes for Bloomberg, so this is kind of the perfect nexus of everything you cover, WWE. Absolutely, yeah. I cover markets and companies, so I'm gonna ask a nerdy company type question to both of you. Um, as a tech platform, tech first platform, Netflix has access to more granular data on viewers and their habits than the conventional broadcasters. So I'm curious, what kind of data or analytics do you hope to get, do you expect to maybe get um, from this partnership that might be able to feed into storylines or how you craft um, moments in, in the matches that we're going to hopefully see? Why don't you start, Roman? I want all that data. I, I'd like to be able to look at all of this stuff and go through these uh, algorithms and analytics that way because we're scripted. We, we can make this whatever whatever's not only right for us, but what's right for the audience. And if we can keep our thumb on that pulse, it just makes the job so much easier. I, I actually think the biggest beneficiary of that is gonna be Netflix. And, 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 and just so that I back up what I'm saying, they just released, and I, and I apologize to the author of, of the article that, that released it, because I don't remember where it was published, but they just released who has the most social impact in WWE. Mm -hmm. And Roman Reigns has been off social media since WrestleMania, which was in early April. Off social media since April. Who has the biggest impact on social media in WWE? Roman Reigns. And the nearest competitor was 15 to 18% behind Roman Reigns, and he hasn't posted one thing since April. The enormity of the social media impact, of the digital impact, that WWE offers and its top star can offer on a global basis mm -hmm. can even take a, a streaming service and the world's biggest streaming service like Netflix and make it humble. It's a good perspective. And now uh, WWE and UFC are together as TKO Holdings. Uh, where have you seen the benefits of that merger and, and what do you want to see WWE leveraging more of in the future from its uh, companion brand, let's say? I think, I mean, you know, as far as the synergy is concerned, it, it just makes perfect sense. Um, but then to, to be able to gain, you know, the experience of uh, Endeavor, to, to be able to have an Aria manual at the helm, um, you know, these type of resources are, are second to none. So, I, you know, just being in the first year, I think we're coming up on the first year uh, anniversary. Um, we've, we've had amazing growth, and I just think it's going to continue. I think the chart speaks for itself, right there. Right. Share it's, price, it's that was it? Yeah. Up, 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 up. And, and that, that's where the stock's at 120 today. And, and, and it hasn't been forever. And why has it been? And then, okay, it's tremendous business by UFC and tremendous business by WWE. And it's a star and story driven industry. And the top star is Roman Reigns. So I, again, I, I will give all the credit in the world to Nick Khan, because that, that is a business leader, the likes of which I've never experienced. And Paul Levesque has been trained to do this job his entire life. And, but I'll also say Mount Rushmore only needs three heads, and the third one, it's Roman Reigns. And like, on, on that note, your, your business has become more global than ever at this point, right? You're, you're having uh, events in Berlin and in Saudi Arabia and, and, and so on. And, uh, and selling out, by And the way. selling them out. So, selling them out in stadiums. And are you thinking a lot about those international audiences like all the time or just like when you go there? How do you, how do you cope with that, that new reality that you're, that you're being blasted out to the, the appearing all over the world these days? It's all I've ever known, to be honest. I mean, I think we're just now getting, you know, in the past, two to three years now getting into a groove of where we're maximizing, you know, the fact that we're global. But since the day I got on the road, you know, I've been traveling internationally, you know, throughout the year for 
over a decade now. Um, and that's what just makes us so just strong in the market is that we can connect anywhere. You know, I, I've vacationed, you know, I've been fortunate enough to vacation some more remote places and they still recognize me because we have that international product that, um, you know, the, the world just seems to be invested in and it's, it's never shown greater than now. What's the most remote place where someone was like, oh my God, it's Roman Reigns? Well, you know, somewhere like, and this, I wouldn't even say this is remote, but somewhere down like in the bottom of the Caribbean, like uh, St. Lucia, you know, I just somewhere I never thought would ever, you know, know who I was. And as soon as I step foot in the airport, they know WWE, they know Roman Reigns. So it, it's just an immediate brand recognition. Um, and, it, and it's not just our big W. They can see it through, you know, through each performer. Um, and, and it's getting to the point now where not only just through the performers, but through our storylines, they're recognizable in their own right. You know, I had to get caught up by Kim on the whole storyline with Roman Reigns uh, and Paul Heyman. And he explained the whole thing about Paul being uh, the wise man to Roman Reigns, the tribal leader. Did I get that right? Chief. Chief. Tribal chief. OK. Oh, yeah. See? We'll, we'll so, let that uh, yeah. slide just this one time, <laughs> just, this, just this once. Well, and I guess that's my point, because the barrier to entry to getting into wrestling, to really understanding it, is not low. It's kind of high. Um, it's hard to kind of tune in occasionally and pick up on these different story threads and understand it and be part of it right away. You know, you have to catch up on a lot of stuff. Kim knows, because he's been watching this since he was a kid. Um, the fact is that scripted content like this might be kind of hard for some adults to, to get over before they really join in the fandom. So I'm curious about what have you guys learned um, about how to make your sport more accessible uh, to newcomers, yet specifically relevant to the diehard fans like him, so that you serve both audiences. Well, we have to do exactly that. We have to serve both audiences, the, the casual fan and then the fan that we believe is completely tuned in with what we're doing every single week. Um, and, and as a talent, this is where it can get, you know, a little bit tricky on, I, Paul will tell you, I don't like to recap. I, I, I don't like to talk about last week program because I'm focused on what we're pushing forward mm -hmm. this week. But sometimes, a lot of times, you have to do that. You have to remind your audience of, you know, just like before you watch a Game of Thrones, they give you a bit of a recap before you go into this new episode. Last week on Game of Thrones. Exactly. So there are times where we will give you that package okay. and give you some of that B-roll. But there's other times where we can creatively fit it into our in real time script, today's script about things that happened last week. So it's a constant battle creatively to continue to keep everybody informed and then also, you know, be cognizant enough to know that there might be a new viewer coming. Hopefully there's a new viewer coming in this week and we need to speed them up and then also entice them to keep them on the ride, you know? I, I go by the sitcom theory. If you ever, like, like what's the most su successful sitcom of all time is Friends. And, and if you watch the later episodes, it's hi, hi, how you doing, great, what's going on, this and that. But if you watch the first two seasons, every single time the, the characters addressed each other, they called each other by their names. Hi, Ross. Hi, Rachel. How you doing, oh. Ross? I'm good, Rachel. What'd you eat for lunch today, Ross? I don't know, Rachel. What'd you eat? And they just keep on saying their names so that when you watch it, you go, oh, that's Ross. Oh, that's Rachel. And you know all the characters' names. I've, I've been doing this for almost 40 years. My shtick is, the first thing I say is, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul Heyman. Because I always presume that the person watching has never seen me before. And any time I address Roman on television, the first thing I say is, yes, my tribal chief. Because they go, oh, okay, I've never watched this before. I don't know who this guy is. God damn, he looks good. But you know what? That's the tribal chief. <laughs> so if you don't know who we are, within a minute of, of, of us presenting ourselves, you at least know, okay, that guy's Paul Heyman, that's his tribal chief. And he serves his tribal chief. Yes, yes. So it, 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 it's, it's, it's always the understanding that there are going to be more first-time viewers every time we're on television or we're not growing our audience. So I'm curious about how you try to reach out to a female audience as well, because according to... Well, take a look at Roman Reigns. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Um, I'm told that women make up anywhere from one-third to 40% of WWE's audience, depending on who you ask. And Stephanie McMahon, the chief brand officer, has said that storytelling is the key. Of course, Roman Reigns 
doesn't hurt either, um, to capturing female fans. So beyond, there's a very competitive female division, as Kim has informed me. I'm curious how the two of you um, advance this effort in the ring. How do you ensure that you capture female audiences and keep them through what you do in the ring and how you present what's happening in the ring? Paul, why don't you go first? I let the product speak for itself. We have so many fun. We have in WWE right now what is the equivalent to when the, the Williams sisters came onto the tennis court. We have the greatest female roster in the history of this industry, and, and they're not just there for sex and, and, and appeal. They, they are there because the women in WWE right now, number one, are the best. I mean, Ronda Rousey came to WWE to display her athletic skills. Mm. And while doing it, she got a chance to also display her own persona as a character. But when Ronda Rousey, who is to MMA what the Williams sisters were to tennis, comes to WWE to do that, it speaks volumes of what we're doing. So the women here are not only magnificent athletes, they have acting chops as well. And you won't find it anywhere else. You'll either find great actresses or you'll find great athletes. And here, you find the marriage of them both. Uh, Roman, you've been essentially the like central character of WWE for years now, right? And uh, I'm going to read this quote from John Cena recently, who just gave you a big shout out. Uh, I don't think there is a better breathing example of the best the business has ever seen, uh, has ever been, than Roman Reigns. Even when fans didn't like him, he was still in a main event spot. He's been in a main event lens for over a decade. In 2012, the stock was trading at $11. WWE TKO stock is now at $117. That's on his shoulders. Do you agree? Have you, you put the team on your back? Well, numbers don't lie. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, I, I wish I could just say I'm the, you know, I'm Taylor Swift out there. Uh, but, you know, we have a big team. I have a, Christ, I have a wise man, you know what I mean? Um, but, you know, business has been really good. Um, yeah, I, you know, this it's one of those weird situations. This is probably normally where I'd be like, Paul, brag about me. Um, <laughs> but at the end of the day, it, it's subjective. You know, there are some objective metrics that are involved that we can measure. But, you know, we can be like, there's 60 people over here that know Roman Reigns is the GOAT. And then there's like two people that, no way. The Undertaker is the greatest of all time. How do you argue with that one, that those two people who believe in their soul that The Undertaker is the, so that's the weird part of our job, and that's the beauty of it, is it's like where objective and subjective meet, and it can really be whatever you feel it is, and as long as you are connected to whose ever product in WWE you're connected to, um, I think you have a rightful claim over that superstar being the greatest to you of all time. Um, as far as what John said, you know, he, he's, look, I, I kind of witnessed and uh, observed his early, uh, you know, reign, if you will, as being WWE's top guy, the, the, the face of the company. Um, so nobody knows better than everything that it takes to get to that point and to even be in the conversation. So I guess I'm just going to agree with him. <laughs> So what does it take to keep that up as the, as the central person that, that everyone you know, re relies upon for these big main event matches and, and everything? Like, what does it take from you to retain that position? Systems. It's no different than any business. I built a bunch of systems over the years to where it's either become instinct or I just I've done it so I don't even think about it because it just is what it is. It's almost discipline. It's just set like that because we've know we we've, we've timed it out. We've looked at everything. We've calculated it all. It's more efficient this way. So we have we need to do it this way. So you build a bunch of these systems, and then all of a sudden you have something in place to where you can go on autopilot if you need to. You can get to that point to where when it's time to go through the curtain, all of you is there. Um, so for me, that's, that's kind of what it's all about, is to be able to do all the processes that it takes to get to the point to go out there and be the very best. Part of that includes bringing your real life family on, on a weekly basis as well, right? Um, your cousins Jimmy and Jay are on the show, um, or on in several matches, correct me? 
Uh, Swiss language, uh, everything. Okay, <laughs> um, and there's a lot of people you grew up with who you now appear on TV with regularly. I'm curious about blurred lines. You know, are there moments where how often do the dynamics of Joe, which is your government name, um, how often does that worm its way into Roman's storylines versus Roman's storylines, you know, seeping into the real life dynamics of Joe? I mean, how do you keep those separate? How, how do you manage it as well, Paul? Uh, Roman, is it just something that you train yourself to think along parallel tracks? Well, you know, it's kind of, you have to have this little perfect threshold of mixing both, you know, because you want to be able to tap, like I need to be, able, when I'm talking to Jay, who in real life, his name is Josh, um, who grew up with Joe, you know, we grew up together. So we have all this chemistry, we have so much, you know, our relationship is a lifetime full of stuff. So to be able to tap into that, I have to still be present within who I am but then I have to also sway it towards the performance and what the story is so I can connect into very real emotions that I've had with Josh and then deliver them as Roman to Jay, if that makes sense. I think I confused the whole room. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the craziness of taking real life, mm -hmm. taking the motivations of you know, your emotions and why you experience these things and then transferring them over to screen to connect to them. So in the Venn diagram, you take that part that overlaps and then you just kind of bring it over as needed. Absolutely. Paul, how, how do you keep track of all this? I have the easiest job in the world. I get to hype someone I actually believe in. You don't need to, they never hand me a script. I don't need a script. For 20 years, I worked with a gentleman named Brock Lesnar. He's the only person in the world that's ever held the UFC, the NCAA, and the WWE Heavyweight Championships. For 20 years, I hyped up Brock Lesnar. Never needed help in doing it. When Brock's run was done, there was only one person I was ever willing to work with. I never thought they'd let us work together. It was Roman Reigns, because I believe in him. I believe he's the best athlete in WWE. If I, had a, if, if I fell down on my way to the ring and I got a concussion, and you handed me Mike and said, just talk. I don't need to think or memorize anything. I can always hype Roman Reigns, because I authentically, genuinely, truly believe in him as the best athlete and the single best performer in the history of WWE. So there are no blurred lines for you. It's all one, the, the Venn diagram is almost just one circle. The, the, the only blurred lines are how do we fit my belief in Roman Reigns into the story that we're trying mm -hmm. to tell. Mm -hmm. That's it. And in doing so, I just have to hype up Roman Reigns. All right, I think we're done. I have just one final question. Is it better to be babyface or is it better to be a heel? Well, the business was its most successful with me as a heel, but you know, the future looks bright, so we'll see, we'll see. It, it's much easier. Uh, I think babyface is an easier um, side to, to actually perform in, but it's so much more fun as a bad guy. Yeah. Heel is a bad guy, babyface is a good guy. Thank you, gentlemen, thank Thanks, you so much. Roman Reigns and Paul Heyman.